Well, hi there, and welcome to our study on the life of Jesus on the Lighthouse Discord server. We're getting very close to Easter in real life, and quite honestly, so is our Bible study, but we're likely not going to align simply because there's too much information. But before we begin today, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you today with thanksgiving in our hearts for who you are, for all that you have done for us, for the fact that you gave us your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sin. We're so undeserving. And yet you did this for us. So as we learn about Jesus walking this earth, as we learn about what he did for us here on earth. Never mind that he's been with you from the beginning as has the Holy Spirit. But help us, Lord, to learn. Help us to open our hearts that this word would get deep into our souls, that we would indeed learn from you this day. And may everything we say and do be a fragrant offering a blessing to you. In your holy name we pray, dear Jesus. Amen. So, at this stage in life, God's clock was ticking in a sense. Time was running out. But Jesus' followers failed to grasp the true nature of his kingdom and the road that he had to follow to claim the throne. At least seven times, Jesus told his friends about the events that would occur in Jerusalem, his rejection, the suffering, his death, and the resurrection. But they were unable to fit the idea of the king's death into their understanding of his reign. And if we want to delve into that a little bit, we could look at Luke, or sorry, chapter 18, verses 31 to 34, and Mark 8, verses 31 to 33. Oh, excuse me, but today we're looking at Luke 19, verse 11. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. This is the New King James Version. See, Jesus' disciples saw the crowds increasing. They heard the people talking. Thousands would gather for the Passover. And many speculated that this celebration of Israel's liberation would be the ideal time to unveil the kingdom. You see... These people clung to the notion that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. And Jesus told a story designed to chip away at their erroneous expectations. Now, if you don't know already, the Jewish people in Bible times anticipated a Messiah who would come in incredibly powerful with massive amounts of ammunition and weapons and money and armed forces to take the Greek leadership by the storm and effectively start or cause the Jewish nation of Israel to be strengthened and be in power. You see, they didn't understand what messiahship really was that jesus was the king of kings or is the king of kings the lord of lords and he's born as a, a baby on earth so we know that a nobleman had been appointed king and while the man was away for his coronation he turned his financial affairs over to 10 trusted servants this is a story by the way giving each amina M-I-N-A, which was about 100 days wages to invest for. And Jesus added that the man's servants hated him 
and sent a delegation to try to prevent his appointment. And we read about that in Luke 19, verse 14. So when the newly appointed king returned, he called his 10 brokers to account for how they'd handled his money. Now one had earned a thousand percent return, Luke 19, verse 16. Another had gained 500% in Luke 19, verse 18. And both were given promotions in keeping with their success. But then came the overscrupulous man who had kept the king's money in a handkerchief in Luke 19, verse 20, because he thought the king was an austere man. Austere, by the way, in the Greek meant sour, harsh, rigid, ungenerous, severe, and disagreeable. So, excuse me, not only was his broker not rewarded for protecting the king's money, it was taken away from him. And he ended up with nothing to show for his trouble but a reprimand. As for those subjects who tried to keep him from reigning, the king issued the order, bring here these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. In Luke 19, verse 27. Now, the interpretation revolves around four characters or groups. The nobleman pictures Christ. The imperial authority to whom he owed his appointment represents God the Father. The ten servants trusted to care for his business represent Christ's disciples. And the rebellious subjects determined to keep him off the, th the throne represent, in effect, Jesus' enemies. Now, this story teaches that between the time Christ left the world to go to his father and his second coming, there would be a lengthy interval. And while waiting for his return, his servants would be entrusted with resources for the work he wanted them to do according to Luke 19, verse 13. So the resources, if you want to have a read, Acts 1.8, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and Romans chapter 12. Leon Morris wrote, in the Christian life, we do not stand still. We use our gifts and make progress or we lose what we have. Let me reread that. In the Christian life, we do not stand still. We use our gifts and make progress or we lose what we have. And I'm going to be honest with you, that's very, very true. God gives us gifts and talents. And it could be one of many things. And if you've been a part of our Wednesday, it used to be our Thursday study, but our Wednesday study where we have been going through 1 Corinthians and now we're into 2 Corinthians, the chapters 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians talks about the spiritual gifts. And it's true, if we don't use them, we can lose them. So in John 11, verse 57, we read, now, both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he, meaning Jesus, was, he should report it, that they might seize him. Now, the last time that Jesus was near Jerusalem at Bethany, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. As, and that, by the way, the story of that is in John 11. So as a direct result of that sign or proof that he was the Messiah, in other words, a miracle, Jesus' enemies in the Sanhedrin pushed through an official edict to arrest him. Now, the Sanhedrin was the Jewish ruling council, by the way. So the outlaw, meaning Jesus, arrived at Bethany, two miles from Jerusalem, at the home of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary six days before the Passover, according to John 12, 1. And Bethany would be his headquarters for the next few days. So each day until Passover, he and his disciples would walk to the temple two miles west and return at night. Then we 
read in John 12, verses 9 to 11. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. You see, the streets of Bethany were filled with curiosity seekers, hoping for a glimpse of one or both celebrities, Jesus or Lazarus, the man alive from the dead, as Lazarus was living proof that Jesus was the Messiah. And the number of people siding with the man religious leaders viewed as public enemy number one increased, while the number loyal to the leaders shrank. And in desperation, the clergy added Lazarus to their list of people to be assassinated for the man who had already died once. Friendship with Christ suddenly became very costly. Then we read in John 12, verse 3, then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the hour was filled, or the, sorry, the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Now, spikenard is not a term used in every version of scripture. But it was precious imported oil from the Indian nard plant. And as Passover week began, a dinner in Jesus' honor was held in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper. Matthew and Mark, those two books, supply the host's name. And Lazarus was there alive and kicking at the table with Jesus. And his sister Martha, in her very usual role, according to Luke 10, verses 38 to 42, served the meal. And at some point in the party, Mary did an unusual thing. She emptied a pound of very costly oil of spikenard on Jesus' head and feet as he reclined at the table. Now, frankly, this was an extravagant act. Some witnesses found such extravagance disturbing. You see, Mary was concentrating on Jesus here. She was dramatizing her love, gratitude, faith, and reverence. And as the costly oil ran over his feet, this high-born woman, in other words, she was not a slave here, let down the tresses of her long hair, something that Jewish women did not do in public, got on her knees behind him and proceeded to wipe the excess spikenard from his feet with her hair. And this, by the way, was perfume from roots of, perennial, of the perennial nard plant. So why would she do this? It essentially represented her love, her absolute gratitude, faith, and reverence of him, in essence, in honor of what would happen to him. In John 12, verses six to, or four to six, we read, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, or Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. So he was a thief all the way along. But hiding behind a smoke screen of concern for the poor, Judas protested the extravagance. And the truth was he was really a petty embezzler. He pilfered the kingdom community's common purse of gifts given to support Jesus' ministry. And Christ's response was to tell the self-motivated critic to stop harassing the worshiper. 
Jesus insisted Mary was preparing him for burial. That was the laying out the corpse for burial, which he knew would come within the week in verse 7. In John 1940, the same word is used for the Jewish custom, excuse me, of wrapping the body with spices and linen. And nard was often one of the spices used. See, no one cared more about the poor than Jesus. Just have a look at Luke 4, 18 to 19, or Matthew 4, 23 to 24, or John 6, verses 5 to 13. And Judas and the other critics within his own ranks, according to Mark 14, 4, needed to understand two realities. First, Jesus would be with them for only six more days. Whatever they were going to do to express their love had to be done soon. And second, there would always be poor people to help after he was gone. There was care of the needy. Matthew 25, verses 35. 34 to 45. And this would become a high priority expression of love to him, according to John 12, verse 8. Venerable Bed, or Bet Bede, B E D E, wrote this We anoint the Lord's head when we cherish the glory of his divinity, along with that of his humanity, and with the worthy sweetness of faith, hope, and charity. And when we spread the praise of his name by living uprightly, we anoint the Lord's feet. When we renew his poor by a word of consolation, so that they may not lose hope when they are under duress, we wipe the feet of these same ones with our hair when we share some of what is superfluous to us to alleviate the wants of the needy. Then we read in Luke 19, verses 35 to 38. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The next day, which was Sunday, which, by the way, is coming up this coming Sunday for us. It's Palm Sunday, we call it. Jesus led the way from Bethany to the Mount of Olives, about a half mile from Jerusalem. And there he paused to put into operation plans for entrance into the city that would fulfill Messianic prophecy. Now, if you're a person who enjoys prophecy, have a read of Isaiah 62, 11. Zechariah 9, verse 9, or sorry, chapter 9, verse 9, and Matthew 21, verse 5. Two disciples were sent into Bethphage, which was a tiny village in the shadow of the city wall, and they would find and borrow a never-before-ridden donkey colt. If, as they untied the colt, the owners asked why, they were to answer with what may have been a prearranged password, because the Lord has need of it, according to Luke 19.31. And the owners would let them take it. Now, by the time the colt arrived, pilgrims were jamming the road. Exuberant disciples made a saddle of their outer cloaks and lifted Jesus onto the back of the animal. Now, Matthew mentions two animals, a donkey and a colt. Both had been brought, according to Matthew 21, verses 2 and 7. Jesus rode the colt and the mother was led along so the colt would be at ease with its first rider. Spontaneously, people laid their clothes on the ground, according to 2 Kings 9, verse 13. And they did this along with palm branches cut from nearby trees 
to form a multicolored royal carpet upon which Jesus rode in kingly triumph the last half mile into the city, according to John 12, verse 13. Thousands waved palm branches. Revelation 7, 9 talks about that and cheered loudly, a common practice for honoring a conqueror. At last, Jesus was doing what the Galileans had wanted him to do after the feeding of the 5,000. This time, he accepted their acclamation of his royalty because he was, after all, the king of Israel. And we're going to look at one more verse or little passage. And that's Luke 19, verses 39 to 40. And some of the Pharisees, which, by the way, the Sanhedrin was largely made up of, but there may have also been some Sadducees, which was another group of uh, Jewish people. But some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. You see, not everyone was thrilled. Many who watched the parade pour into the streets of Jerusalem were still asking, who is this? According to Matthew 21.10, the Pharisees demanded Jesus stop his supporters from shouting these unnerving Bible slogans. But you see, his kingship had to be proclaimed or the huge stones in the temple walls would find voices. This was the day for the cosmos to acknowledge Jesus is king. And then we read in Luke 19 verses 41 to 44. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it saying, if you had known, even you, especially this, in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. So as the borrowed donkey carried him through the city gate, Jesus wept, which by the way in the Greek actually meant that he wailed. He broke into sobs and he prophesied the city's destruction. And 40 years later, every tragic detail of his prophecy found in Luke 19 verses 43 to 44 was fulfilled. In AD 70, Jerusalem was sacked. The temple was reduced to rubble and burned by the armies of Emperor Titus and 1,100,000 Jews were killed. Michael Card wrote this. How can we call it the triumphal entry? When Jesus was still wiping tears from his eyes, the disciples were singing. Jesus was weeping. Jesus' first coming was characterized by misunderstanding, but there will be a second. The misunderstood Messiah, who that day was a lamb, will return as a lion. Jesus will not be wiping tears of sorrow from his eyes, but most likely tears of joy and relief. And he will be wiping away our tears as well. Let's pray. Jesus, to think of all that you went through. When you entered back into Jerusalem and were beaten and held and tortured, and accused of all of these things that you did not do, and yet died on the cross for our sins. It's horrendous, Lord. 
to even think that you went through all of that when you didn't do anything wrong. And yet it's because of us that you did this, that we would have the opportunity of spending eternity with you, of spending eternity in heaven. And so, Lord, as we prepare for Palm Sunday, may we remember that you entered Jerusalem as king, as Lord, and that while you died for us, and that day was horrific, had you not died, then how would we be with you? We wouldn't have a way unless God had created an alternative. But this was his will. And so we give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you glory and honor. In your holy name we pray, dear Jesus. Amen.